All right, so good morning. I forgot to bring a roll sheet this morning because I had a special class that I had to teach at 8 o'clock for an insurance company here. So in our practical class, the sales teams go out and they sell various packages for um, murder mysteries and generators and then also for sales training and things like that. And so I had one that they sold that I had to do training for this morning. So I did that at 8 o'clock and I got there at 9 rush to get over here so that I can open the door in time for you all to, to get your seats. I have another one on Thursday and the long and short of that is is that I forgot to print off a roll sheet because I had to get up at like five this morning to be ready and get my stuff ready and copied off for this presentation. So I'm a little discombobulated. So I apologize for that. So there's no roll sheet today, which means I'll have to take notes and write down where we got to. But we need to talk about free approach and telephone techniques today. It probably won't take the entire class period, and so you'll have the rest of the time um, to work with your partner if you need to on your sales presentation or to find a salesperson to interview or if you have questions, I'll hang around for a few minutes to answer those. Um, free approach planning is really critical to your success because it's going to be determinative of whether or not you see the right people at the right time. So in sales, the key to selling is see enough people, see the right people, and see them at the right time. And you want to do this efficiently. You want to make sure that prospects are actually qualified prospects, that you're seeing the right people at the right time. And so one of the things that we have you do here in, in the sales program is, and a lot of students don't like it, is we require you to take the purchasing class if you're going to be a professional sales major. And a lot of students, why do I need to take the purchasing class? And a lot of sales students hate that class because it's boring. It deals with supply chain management and purchasing and all those kinds of things. But the truth is, is that it's the other side of the transaction in the business to business context. And so understanding that, is going to be critical. So how do you see the right people? Again, in the business to business context, who is the ultimate purchasing decider here? You see, oh, well, if it's anything over $5,000, there's two people on this campus that can actually sign contracts. Now, are you probably, for example, with running management systems when we went through D2L, did the sales rep actually meet with the president? No, it probably, they came out and met with the vice president of information technology and the committee that that looked at it and the buyers and the purchasing center, but the actual person who signs the contract is the president or the vice president for administration and finance. And so pre approach planning is important in understanding who it is that you're going to need to see and be prepared prior to making that contact. So finding the right decision maker is critical and understanding who that person is, where they fit in, and who are the people that also are the centers of influence. Also, finding out how to pronounce the prospect's name is important, and that's part of your pre-approach planning, so that you get it right, so that you ensure that you have the correct pronunciation. Names are important, particularly in sales. And again, the sales cycle is a continuous process, and there's no clear break between one phase, in other words, for prospecting and pre-approach. A lot of times, prospecting and pre-approach will blend right into each other. It's sort of a, a, a nice nexus there. Connection between them. So, what is the pre-approach checklist? Well, who is the ultimate decision maker? But who else influences the buying decision? Let's suppose you're selling. You all did eighty or you did Paycom last time. Who's gonna? You know, let's say you wanted to sell to UCO. You wanted to convince us that we need to switch our payroll system over from. Our legacy system where we run our own payroll here for the people in payroll and you decide that you want to make a pitch that UCO should outsource that function. Well, who's going to influence that buying decision in terms of the payroll? Well, probably the human resources department is going to play a big part in that because payroll and benefits are under human resources. So if you're dealing with a larger company, if they have an HR department, they may not be able to buy it themselves, 
the company may require higher approval than the director of HR, but those people are going to be important in getting their buy-in. Because if you don't get their buy-in, they're going to sabotage your ability to try and sell. So they are, are influential. Here at UCL, when we buy things like learning management systems, they generally go through a committee that involves people like faculty who have to use it. We oftentimes will put students on those committees so that they can test out products that we're gonna buy. So those people are influential in the buying decision, but they don't have the actual final say. How often does the company buy my type of services or products? D2L is not the first learning management system, for example, that we've had at UCL. What did we have before we had D2L? Well, we had the first one I think that we had years ago was called Angel. And I think then that we went to Blackboard. I think we had Blackboard. Um, and Blackboard basically, Angel got bought out, Blackboard got bought out. And so there, there's a consolidation in that industry tends to be oligopolistic in terms of the competitive market for that type of product. So, but once we buy something like that, it's not something we're gonna buy again for quite a while, once something happens to the, the platform. How well is the company satisfied with the present supplier? Well, I can tell you that I hate D2L. I think it's a horrible program. But the fact that I'm dissatisfied, does that mean anything? Eventually, enough professors become dissatisfied with it. I suppose it might mean something that we might start looking at buying a new one. But you know, how, how satisfied are the people that matter? Who's going to matter in that kind of decision? Well, it's going to start with, with regard to how satisfied they are. If you're selling something like a, a learning management system to UCL, you're probably going to start asking the IT department because they're the ones that actually manage complaints that you have. When I have a problem with D2L, and they're not particularly helpful, by the way, at answering, I usually have to figure out the whole process on my own. And D2L is not a very friendly website in terms of the user interface compared to other learning management systems that are out there. So if there's enough complaints that are filtered up through I, uh, through the faculty and staff to IT, they, they may be a good source, but they're gonna be the ones that you probably, if you're selling learning management systems that you're gonna talk to. Again, if you're selling payroll systems, how satisfied are we? You know, That's gonna be a, something that the HR department is gonna look at, and whether or not um, we're, we're you know, happy with the legacy system that we use for payroll here, which is goes through Banner. We basically do it ourselves in-house. When outsourcing first became big in government contracting, there were lots of companies that started housekeeping services. And we outsourced, we used to have all of the facilities management staff that did housekeeping actually were hired directly by UCO and they were eligible for UCO benefits. So they got health, dental, vision, all of that through UCO. And they got teacher's retirement, which the school pays for. The school pays into the teacher's retirement system. Well, when you know we had a company that approached a vice president at the time and convinced him that they could do the they could do the job a lot cheaper. And why could they do the job a lot cheaper? Well, they didn't have all of the overhead costs associated with their service that we had to provide. If you are a UCO employee. We cannot discriminate against you and say you can't get these benefits. But if you're not our employee, they can hire people. We were, we were horribly inefficient in that because we had to provide things like health benefits and all of the other, the other uh, range of benefits that are provided to each and every employee. Well, when you contract that out, guess what they weren't providing? Why was why were they more efficient and why were they cheaper? They weren't paying into teachers' retirement for these people. They weren't.
paying into any retirement at all. If those, if those employees wanted any hope of retirement, they were going to have to, you know, the company I think that we initially contracted with offered a 401k plan, but what do you have to do with the 401k? It's the employee that has to pay for it. They have to invest in it themselves. Now, if the company is a benefit-rich company, which this company obviously wasn't, they will contribute to the 401k. Now, overall, one of the things that I argued against when we went to the contract and I had a big fight with the vice president at the time was, I said, you shouldn't assume that just because it costs us more, that it is inefficient. Because one of the things that happened when we actually had custodial staff here on the premise is we didn't have to keep the doors locked all the time because there was somebody that was walking around. We now have to make sure that the doors are locked so that you all don't run off with our projectors or our computer monitors. In the college. A lot of those have gotten stolen over the years. In faculty offices, because those people are not UCO employees and we don't know, they, they send in different crews all the time there are lots of people that have on their office door no custodial access because the custodians, I had a refrigerator in my office for a long time, and I would come in and like the Diet Cokes would all be gone. You know, because they didn't know who they they sent it out a crew, and you know, the crew decided which amongst themselves sort of at the initial one which which buildings they were in. So they had no idea who was was doing what and who was where. Um, it's gotten better, but it's still not perfect because they're not UCO employees. But we weren't we weren't satisfied with the with the, the cost that it was costing us, and so they decided to outsource. So how satisfied are we with present suppliers? If you're dealing with a company that's that's selling payroll, again, these the payroll examples, since that's one of the products that we sell. Um, what's another payroll company? Well, ADP. ADP is the largest. Are you satisfied with ADP? Do you have the same account? Uh, services that that payroll that paycoms uh, are able to offer, for example, small to mid-sized businesses. What plans does your prospect, does the company in the business-to-business -business context, have that could affect their willingness to buy from you? Switch <coughs> things like mergers and acquisitions are important, and those are important sources of information. Something that was not a prospect at one time, after a merger or acquisition, you can be dealing with new people and maybe uh, a prospect, something that you should pursue. What are the backgrounds of the persons interested and concerned in the buying decision process? So if you've got an HR department that you're dealing with, what kinds of backgrounds do they have? If that department is heavily focused on, so HR has, it's kind of lumped in a lot of functions into the HR department. Historically speaking, what were HR department, what were they called? They weren't called human, human resources is a fairly modern term. What's it called? No. They were called personnel, the personnel office. And that has a much more limited term, doesn't it, than human resources? What's personnel connect? What does it sort of say? In management theory, Max Weber talks about the ideal structure of an organization. And he says the ideal structure, he was a German sociologist, said the ideal structure of an organization is one that's hierarchical. There are three characteristics of a ideal organization. And he said a bureaucracy was the ideal organization. So it's got it's got three characteristics. So you've got these levels on a pyramid, right? So you've got the CEO, and here you've got the vice president's levels, and then below the vice presidents, you have directors of various things. So for example, you might have a vice president for administration in your company. And that person will oversee things like benefits, human resources, you know, um, maintenance and facilities, things like that, contractual uh, budgeting, all those kinds of things. And then you have directors, so you have like director of HR, right? And the director of budget, 
And then below the director's levels, you have managers. And below managers, you have supervisors, something like this. And then down here at the bottom, you have lots of little boxes. And these are your sort of functional employees that, that you know, interface with your constituency. And so Weber says the ideal characteristic of a organization is that it's got a hierarchy. It's got a high degree of specialization. And it operates on a basis of rules. It's rule bound. Now, the idea when we had personnel offices, the reason I tell you all of this is that when we used to call it personnel, personnel has a much, it was, it was the sort of Weberian view that these people and these that fill these boxes, these slots, have job descriptions and they're cogs in a machine. That's what Weber believed, that people were just sort of cogs in a machine. And if the cog wasn't working, just like on a car, if you have a cylinder that's misfiring, what, what's a likely cause of the problem with a cylinder misfiring? Well, one of the simplest things may be what? Spark plugs. The spark plugs. That, that, yeah. So if the spark plug is misfiring, what do you do? Replace them. You pull the spark plug out and you put a new spark plug in. It's just plug and play, right? And that's how they were sort of viewed bureaucracies. It was like a machine. And you could pull these out. And this idea of personnel was that they just sort of, you know, file the paperwork on these people. Did the, you know, took them took them in in terms of getting them to fill out the application, getting hired, giving them their benefits, and keeping all of the paperwork in, in a nice file. Getting that uh, I-9 form that the IRS requires that you fill out for withholdings, right? Then there started to be a recognition that personnel, like maybe we shouldn't treat people like cogs in a machine. There's something nice about this model in that it's A, simplistic, and B, it, it's easy to implement if you just follow the rules, but that there was this recognition, I guess beginning in like the 1960s, and it really caught on you know, by the 1990s, that personnel was a very limited function. That was just sort of connoting uh, filing paperwork, whereas what maybe you should be doing is viewing these people not just as cogs in a machine, but as a resource, as an asset to the company. And so HR has a lot of different functions like payroll and benefits, but also employee relations and training and the development of those human resources asset, assets. And so, you know, if you go, if you look at what people now get degrees in in human resources, they actually learn about all of these, these different things. So do you have a, a human resources department that's largely focused on employee relations and training, if that's primarily their background, is developing human resources and not necessarily the technical stuff of payroll and benefits, those sort of quantitative skills, you might have a whole different situation than a firm that's heavily leans towards one that, you know, human resources is really just focused on comp and benefits and, and doing that well. And so what's the background and the personnel interests of the people that are going to be making the decision, uh, the decisions in your organization. And how can you find that out? Again, going back to the prospecting, what are you gonna look at to find that kind of stuff out? Where are you gonna look? What's a good source for information like that? LinkedIn, which is a professional, right? Uh, networking site, LinkedIn, things like that. Is the company's uh, staff technically informed? Um, do we, this is an important one, do we use any of their products in our company? Let's suppose you want to sell Paycom to UCO. Well, do they use any of our, any of our products in their company? Uh, former students? Yeah, they sure do. They, they hire a lot of our former students from the sales program as salespeople in, in Paycom. They also hire a lot of our IT, uh, IT professionals at Paycom. And 
the CEO and founder of Paycom is a what? He's a UCO graduate, which is why the stadium is, is named after them. So do, do they use any part? That's, that's a, it's hard to tell somebody who's your customer, no, isn't it? And oftentimes business relationships involve these kinds of reciprocal partnerships that become really important. Do any of our executives know any of their executives personally? Yes, uh, our president knows the president and CEO of Paycom personally. Our vice president of development, Han Ann Holtwein, knows, the, knows him personally. Our sales um, faculty know him personally. So mergers and acquisitions, I already said, are an opportunity with companies that have maybe denied you in the past. Personnel changes can lead to new opportunities. Firms adding or dropping product lines can, subject, uh, can suggest new emphasis that gives you a reason to call on that business and establish a relationship. Looking at their advertising, their websites, those are all valuable sources of information about prospects in the business to business context and the business to business context. Sales training, what kinds of press releases that they, that they put out. When I worked for the American Education Corporation, we put out press releases every quarter. We had to file with the SEC something called a 10Q and at the end of the year, we had to file a, a year end report called a 10K. And along with those, we would put out statements from the company concerning earnings and stuff like that, and those would be published in the journal record. And all of those kinds of things are sources of information that you can find uh, to be very useful and valuable in prospecting and pre-approach planning. So setting up the interview, what is the prospect's preferred time? How are you going to find this out? Generally, if you're dealing with the business to business context, how are you going to find it out? Well, these gatekeepers are people that are going to be valuable. So you want to sell to the gatekeeper. This was something I learned early on in my life. I wanted to be a lawyer, and so I was fascinated by the legal system. Our next door neighbor was an appellate court judge on the New Mexico Court of Appeals. And he knew that I wanted to be a lawyer. I said I wanted to be a lawyer from an early age. But I rapidly learned that if I wanted to get in to see him, he would write notes for me to get out of class if they were having a particularly interesting oral argument on a death penalty case or something like that that he thought I would be interested in. And I got him to write letters to excuse me from class to go watch oral arguments when I was in the fifth and sixth grade. And I realized that if I wanted to get in to see him, I had to go through his secretary, the gatekeeper. And so I was always nice to her. Those people are enormously, there are formal power structures that you can find on flowcharts. So for example, if you look at the UCO flowchart, what, what does it start with? Well, in the grandest sense, you start with the sovereign state of Oklahoma, right? the people of the state of Oklahoma who elect a governor, who appoints a board of regents, right? The board of regents then appoints a president. And then under the president, if you draw, if you drop this diagram down, it starts becoming wider, less, less flat. You have vice presidents of administration and finance, vice presidents of student services, a vice president of academic affairs, all of these people, right? And you look at the formal power structure, and on that formal power structure, if you look at where secretaries are, they're way down on the flow chart. But if you want to get in to see the provost, and he is a huge source of influence. The Vice President of Academic Affairs is called the Provost. If you want, I mean, if you want to get in to see him because you think you've got a better learning management system and it can do more things, for example, we're very committed to this idea of transformative learning, and you think that D2L is just a sucky platform for engaging in transform, and it is. You, know, you might want to influence that 
vice president, how are you going to get him to see him? You're going to have to go through at least two secretaries there. They control the calendar. And they're going to know when he likes to see people and how available he is and how receptive he's going to be to granting you an audience to see him, right? So these gatekeepers are enormously important. Social networking is enormously important. That's one of the reasons why most business people, again, join things like the uh, social charity clubs, like uh, Ambux and um, the Elks and, and those other kinds of networking organizations that you can use to build contacts with people. And of course now, in this day and age, we can do a lot of that social networking online through LinkedIn. So how are you going to get these? A lot of times now, the, the most powerful way to get to see somebody is to actually, and your generation hates doing this, you prefer to text. And so I have started trying to oblige your generation's need to text. Why is it you like to text? Studies show that your generation is horribly afraid of rejection. And texting is a very cool medium. As a result, we've come up with ways to try and make it less cool by adding emoticons to it. But the written word is notoriously difficult to interpret and can be ambiguous. But your generation really likes to text. But if you're going to sell, you're going to have to get an appointment. You're probably going to have to call on the phone. If you can actually go out, and in a lot of territories and a lot of outside sales jobs, you actually will go out and make, make calls. If you go to work for Henry Schein or for Johnson & Johnson selling medical device, you actually will go out to doctor's offices and make contacts. It's very hard when somebody is standing there to tell them no. It's very easy to tell them no, I don't have time in a text, isn't it? Or over email. It's very, very easy for me to, it's very easy for me to hit the delete. It's one of the reasons I hate email. I think I told you all I've had my email account here since I was a graduate, since I was a graduate student at UCO. So I get a voluminous amount of junk mail, and it's really easy for me to just hit the delete, 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 delete on that email very quickly. Now your generation likes it. Why? Because, you know, you, you don't hear the rejection. It's hard to turn somebody down if they're actually in your office. Um, but a lot of times you can't do that, so you're going to have to use the telephone. You're actually going to have to get the uh, interview. This is a mini sale. And again, you may have to make this mini sale to the gatekeeper, so the person who knows whether or not they're going to be willing to see you. So there's an age-old adage, and it's true, that says... You can never, wrong uh, you never get a second chance to make a first impression. There we go. All of a sudden I had one of my senior moments and I apologize. First impressions are really important. Now I will tell you that students overwhelmingly tell me initially if they talk to me, in person, which some of you do, particularly sales students that go with me on trips, that their first impression of me is that I'm a pompous ass. And I've had students write that in my student evaluations, you are a pompous ass. That's probably true. In spite of that first impression, I have some of the highest student evaluations in the college. Now, I don't have the highest in our department always. I, it's a toss up a lot of times between about three of us that have really good evaluations in the department. And the reason that that is, is because everybody in our department are marketers. So they all know how to influence student value. We all know how to influence student evaluations. And they don't know how to do that in accounting and finance, apparently. So I tell you this because students' initial first impression of me is not necessarily positive. But by the end of a class, if they've had me, and a lot of students take me for more than one class, I get overwhelmingly positive student evaluations. I get really good evaluations. Now, why is that? Why is it that I can recover 
from that negative first impression. Why is it that most people have that negative first impression of me? It's because one of the things is, is that I walk in and I dress like a lawyer should dress most of the time. I didn't put on a tie and a coat today because there was a deluge out there and I didn't want to get one of my nice silk bow ties all <laughs> screwed up in the rain or a jacket and have to take it and have it, you know, dry clean and pressed after uh, the wool just melts. But most of the time, how do I dress? Most of the time I wear at least a sports coat, slacks, and a top, usually a suit. And bow ties, by the way, people say that they love them in person, but they actually have studies show um, looking at brain wave activity, people actually have a negative reaction to them, and why is that? They're seen as being very shallow and pretentious because most people don't know how to tie them. I know how to tie. Them. I like bow ties. It's sort of my, you know, part of my brand image is the bow tie. But just that physical appearance can be intimidating to students. Why is it that at the end I I overcome that and get to good student evaluations. Well, because again, I think students, after they've interacted with me for a period of time, figure out that I really do, by and large, on the whole, care about your success. And I want you to be successful. And in spite of the fact that I probably look like I'm an enormously hard grader and my tests are somewhat difficult, I give you lots of opportunities to earn bonus points and to get, so I'm, you know, my grade distribution is pretty, pretty good. It's pretty high. And there's a correlation there between that. The difference between me and a salesperson is that you're going to have to put up with me if you're a marketing major, at least for one class, because I'm the only one historically who teaches Marketing ethics and marketing ethics is required of every professional sales major and every marketing major. So you're going to have to put up with me for at least one class. You can avoid me for principles. You can take Dr. Yoon. You can avoid me for the introduction to professional sales because you can take Bob Kaiser. You can't avoid me for ethics, except this semester, which we got screwed up, but that's a whole. But I, next semester, I'm back to teaching my ethics courses. So... You have to put up with me. I will never forget, I was teaching a Thursday night class, 7.30 to 10.10, 10. that's a horrible time period at night. Thursday, it's just awful. People are just horrible, they're tired. It's worse than you are. I, I know that 9.30 is your homage to the idea that you can actually get up before noon and make it here. You know, I, I would really like to teach this class at about seven because I'm up at five but nobody would take it at that point in time. There would just be a boycott against my class. We used to offer a seven o'clock class. It was very popular when we had a, an older student population. But you don't have a choice, at least in one class. You have to put up with it. That's not the case for your customers, right? If you don't make a good first impression with them, they don't have to buy from you. And that's what the difference is. Now, if you don't, if you don't get off to a good first impression, you may be able to recover, but it will be enormously difficult to do that. So making that first impression, and it often starts with the phone. So what do you want to do to make that first impression on the phone? If you're having to, to use the phone, you can't go in person. You want to avoid the monotone pitch. Use inflection. Avoid Ben Stein, Bueller, Harris, Harris, Bueller. Right? Avoid that. Volume. Are you too soft? Most of you, it says, or are you, text tells you, are you too loud? Most of you are too what? Soft. Most of you are too soft. Why is that? Not confident. Yeah, it's a lack of confidence. And you're too, you speak too softly. I, on the other hand, am overly confident. Because when you watch the videos, I hear some. 
you can hear me clearly and distinctly. No, even though the microphone is, is back there. Most people speak too slowly, particularly those of us who are not from the Northeast. If you go to the, if you go to New York City, people have a tendency to talk faster. The further south you go, the slower it gets, and that can be a problem in keeping people's attention. So don't speak too slow. Most people don't actually have a problem with being too fast unless you're really nervous and then you try to get through it quickly. And that can be a problem if the company gives you a script that they want you to follow when making calls and prospecting. Quality of your voice, practice actually smiling when you talk. Force yourself, if you have to, hold the pencil 30 seconds before you make a phone call in your mouth that forces you to smile. And small changes like that, we know that your mind can affect your body. But can your body affect your mind? Yes, it can. How can the mind affect the body? If you are around depressed people, you have a tendency to take on depressed attitudes. It can Depression can be actually contagious. They've studied this. If you have a depressed person in your house, and that, can, that can affect your attitude. But your body can also affect your mind. Forcing yourself to sit up straight and smile, practice power posing can actually help. Make sure you enunciate clearly so that people don't have to don't have to gas at your words. And this is really big among your generation. I don't know what it is about your generation, but it's part of the you speak too softly and slowly, and you all have a tendency to mumble. I noticed this in student presentations. It's one of the reasons I take the take these and ask you to actually watch yourself when you, when you talk and present. Um, so enunciate. You want to organize the call, have an agenda. Why are you calling? What is your proposal? How do I get the person to grant my request? How does the telephone script sound? Practice it. Record yourself. If your company actually gives you a script, record it and actually practice that. All right, so that you actually know how you're sounding, what your cadence is, what your rate of speech is. How it, how it will project to somebody that you're trying to get you to grant an interview. So six step track, introduce yourself and your company, take the curse off the call. A lot of telemarketers don't do this. They don't, you know, they start out with trying to build rapport too easily and they don't, uh, you know, people are naturally skeptical. So take the curse off the call. State the purpose of your call. Have an interesting statement, a wow statement. There's no one formula for a wow statement. Think about that. Request, actually ask. This is a mini close. Ask for the appointment. People are overwhelmingly generally in our society polite. And they don't really like to tell people no. But you have to ask. You have to be willing to ask people to do that. So overcoming that resistance by actually asking. All right. We had a couple of people that had not gone, a couple of groups that had not gone last time. Did your group not go last time? Oh, yeah. And you don't have anybody here again today. I have like the stuff. You have the stuff? Yeah. Do you want to talk about yours today? Yeah. Or do you want to wait till Thursday? Uh, wait till your group didn't go either, did you? No. I don't think we were here that early. No, no. You weren't here for your group. Okay. And we're here for prospecting. We'll get with him so that you guys can do it. Make a presentation on Thursday so I can give you points for that. Yeah. All right. All right. So that will give you the rest of the time to work on your product if you need to, or go find a sales interview. So.
since we didn't have the two girls that I count on and planned on. If you feel cheated yeah. by my letting you go early or you know, not talking the full time, you let me know and we'll stay after on Thursday. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.